The Legal Mindset Corner will begin after a brief word from today's sponsor, Answering Legal. Visit answeringlegal.com to learn more about our 24-7 virtual receptionist team. Answering Legal has been pivotal to allow our virtual law firm to thrive. Without them, we would not be able to handle the call volume that comes to our law firm. We needed a service that would allow us to be able to take those messages, yet still focus on working with our clients and be able to call them back. Answering Legal has been phenomenal on getting a great customer service relationship with people that are calling into the firm, taking messages, giving us those messages, and we can get back to them very shortly. Legal Mindset Corner, sponsored by our friends at Answering Legal. Now, my co-hosts, Becky Howlett and I, Cynthia Sharp, are devoted to exploring a range of topics that impact lawyer well-being. That includes mindfulness, work-life integration, digital communication, resilience, healthy communication, and much more. Today, we are privileged to have with us Buddy Stockwell, the Executive Director of the Tennessee Lawyers Assistance Program. Thank you so much for joining us today, Buddy. Oh, it's great to be here. It's wonderful to be here with you guys. I'm glad to be able to contribute. Well, and, and from, from what I've, I've seen when we found you online, it looks like you've contributed a lot for a lot of years, and thank you for that. And how did you get involved in this work? Well, the Lawyers Assistance Program, that whole work, you know, working with lawyers, judges, impaired legal professionals came naturally because when I was admitted to the bar in the state of Louisiana in 1993, I had already been in recovery from alcoholism and addiction for 10 years. So I was a natural to join uh, the, the Committee on Alcohol and Drug Abuse and get involved and support the mission of trying to help impaired lawyers. So ready-made fit the day I was sworn in. Great. And so um, since you've been working in the field, I know we talked when we had our pre-chat about lawyers being at a higher risk of suicide compared to the general population. And as difficult of a topic as this is to discuss, I'd like to elaborate on that a little bit more. Do you have any theories? Well, sure. And, you know, there have been a lot of studies done, and, and I guess the, the most recent watershed moment in establishing lawyer uh, mental health was the ABA study in 2016. I know that everybody's very familiar with it. And of course, we got a lot of statistics from that. And there was 11% suicidal ideations in the legal profession. We know that there's so much about practicing law. Uh, it cuts both ways. Now, let's preface this. I love being a lawyer. It's a noble profession love everything about it. But the fact of the matter is, is it's very stressful. It's a win-loss environment. We have a 30% depression rate, a 20% alcoholism rate. Uh, you know, we have this suicidal ideation rate that's way off the charts compared to other professions. Uh, so and, and it, just in, in terms of what happens to lawyers occasionally, not necessarily with a pathology, but over 50% of lawyers are going to have some anxiety issues. 40%, some depression issues that may come and go. So we're seeing now that all of this is a very treacherous landscape. And so then we come in with the well-being wellness movement that followed that, that mission uh, in 2018, the, the toolkit, the path to lawyer well-being in 2017. And, and where is all this coming from? Well, it's a really simple premise, and that is uh, there's this perfectionism in law, and there's also pessimism in law. So we, we started you know, fit, trying to figure out, like, where does this come from? Why is this not happening in other professions? Well, first off, the perfectionism is really hard to control in practice in law. So there's so many things you can't control. Your client, the other client, the judge, the facts of the case, et cetera, et cetera. But you're hired to get results, and you're hired to do a perfect job. The other thing that makes it difficult 
is that we have to look at things through a lens that's predominantly pessimistic. So if I was going to put together a contract, Cindy, for you and Becky, and I was going to represent one of you guys, and so I'm going to represent Becky, well, what is my job? My job is to figure out every dirty, nasty trick that Cindy could do to Becky in this business and somehow rip her off from kind of way or, or take advantage of her, you know, the, your business plan to protect her from any kind of ill will or bad business practices. So that means I have to think of every single thing that could go wrong and prepare for that and look at this through a totally negative lens. I could never write a contract that says, Cindy and Becky are obviously wonderful people. Human goodness will prevail sign here. That would be malpractice. So this whole thing about being pessimistic and perfectionistic is just poison to some people. Interestingly, the win-loss thing that happens, uh, yeah, well, that happens in professional sports. I mean, there are other arenas of professional activity where you have this win-loss and competition type situation. But the thing we found out, too, as well, is that sports teams that have an optimistic corporate culture instead of pessimistic corporate culture do much better. Mm -hmm. So by the very nature of what we have to do in law and the pressure and all of that landscape, it really does put us at greater risk. I, I don't think I had considered it. And I always consider the legal field in terms of adversarial, but putting the uh, the framework of pessimistic. And obviously in our work, we really promote mindfulness meditation and, you know, cultivating a positive state of mind, a, a state of mind of gratitude. And I, I love that you're bringing in the the sports uh, aspect, you know, sports psychology. That's huge. I'm, I'm here in Lawrence, Kansas, home of the Jayhawks. And, you know, it, it really does make a difference. Uh, and that, that I had not heard that about the the corporate culture and having, you know, if you have this positive corp corporate culture, you're going to have the, the trickle down effect in, into success. Yeah, it's the old saying, you know, the, the beatings will continue until morale improves. Those organizations <laughs> don't do as well, uh, you know, as ones with a positive thing. The other, the other analogy that lawyers like to talk about, I, I didn't coin this. Other people have I've talked about this before I have. But just think about if you were a, a, literally a brain surgeon and you were in the operating room and you had this wonderful team of nurses and, and other people in the operating room with you. Uh, the, the family's out in the waiting room. Everybody's hoping for a great outcome. We're all working together. Things are going well. You've gone to a great medical school. I mean, everything is going the right way. And then think in the middle of the operation, if another doctor, just as skilled as you are, with just as skilled a team, came into the operating room and started trying to kill the patient and started to try and undo all the work that you're doing, and not only that, make you look stupid and terrible and like you're doing a bad job and get you fired. Okay, that's what happens in the practice of law. While I'm trying to triage my client's legal problems, be they criminal or civil or otherwise, I have someone just as skilled on the other side trying to kill my patient and trying to harm the person that I'm trying to help. So that's another way to look at it. Nobody else does that. I mean, there's not another profession in the world where that happens. So the stakes are high. Again, not knocking what we do. I love being a lawyer. I love everything about it. But people have to understand it's high stakes and it's gotten worse and worse over time uh, because now with lawyer advertising and people can point to different things as to why, you know, we stopped having clients and started having quote unquote customers uh, with unrealistic expectations sometimes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of that adds to the pressure. Uh, and and the, when the outcomes are bad, clients uh, tend to, to not be so forgiving, even when the lawyer's done a great job. So in 2024, the practice of law is just as noble as it's always been. But the speed of information flow has been terrible. All these screens, you know, too much information too fast. The lawyers checking their email, at, you know, at 11 o'clock at night before they go to sleep the first thing in the morning and answering emails after work hours. Boundaries have just virtually melted away. Uh, and it really, this well-being movement had, couldn't have come at a better time. I mean, it, 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 we're going to see if people can, you know, hang on to those boundaries and establish them. But as you ladies both know, it's just been really difficult uh, with the flow of information. That's been poison as well. 
Well, and, and you know, as we as we think about the the pessimism, uh, I can I can I am thinking at all different levels as to how that's unhealthy. So, for example, as an individual lawyer, if you're trying a case, you know that there is basically you got a 50-50 chance. Maybe not in every given case, but overall, somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose. So you have to set yourself up for failure. You're psychologically, uh, I very well may lose. And then, then the, 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 the one problem that I know that I have uh, attorneys that I know and coach that uh, they make the mistake of falling in love with their case. So they just, and then they're just shocked when they lose. Like, how could this possibly be? And so there is just a lot of, of cognitive dissonance that, that happens. Yeah, it, it, it's hard. And look, I, I've practiced in a large firm, small firm, my firm. <clears throat> my solo practice in Baton Rouge, Louisiana was predominantly probably 80 percent, really just two fisted, vicious domestic litigation in the four different family courts in East Baton Rouge Parish. And, you know, it, it didn't take me long to figure out, like, what's where, does, where do my duties begin and end? Okay, and, and being able to explain this to my clients. Now, you come in and you give me a fact pattern. Uh, we figure out how it fits into the law, what should happen. Then we talk about the four different judges. If we file suit, that's kind of a roll of the dice. And who, who's the judge that we're going to get? And what are the potential four outcomes? Because all these judges may have different viewpoints. I mean, the law is the law, but the judges get to interpret that law. And what might they expect to happen and get all of that done up front and then let them know my job is to go in and tell this judge, to present to this judge your case with the appropriate evidence, evidence being admitted into the record and let them know in no uncertain terms why we should win. I mean, to make sure your story is accurately told and supported by all the evidence we can support it with. And then I sit down, my job is over. I'm not in the outcome business. I'm in the effort business and not in the outcome business and being able to turn it over and let your client know, like, that's as far as I can go. You know, you're not been, you can't hire me to get a result per se. You can certainly hire me to go in and put on a great case and do what needs to be done. But at the end of the day, we're going to be waiting on the, the judge to let us know or a jury let us know, depending on the type of case. And then we'll have to go from there. Might we appeal it? Maybe so, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, we're not in the outcome business as practicing lawyers. Oh, I love your perspective on that. Yeah. Well, it's the only and way I to survive. Was... You know, you can't deliver <laughs> outcomes. You know, any any lawyer, this was the first guy I ever went to work for, the senior lawyer in a large firm that hired me. Very quickly, two weeks into being sitting at a desk as a lawyer, he came into my office one day and he, no, no, you know, segue into this statement. He just walked in and looked at me and pointed at me and said, buddy, just remember this. I've never seen a case that I couldn't lose for reasons I never thought of. And he turned around and walked out. So <laughs> it's kind of the way it is. Yeah. You yeah do that confidence. You do, well, you do your best. I mean, you know, and, and that's it. I mean, you have to do your best and then turn it over. And so, you know, all the different things that are affecting lawyers these days and putting pressure uh, you know, some of it is, you know, of course, there's substance use disorder related suicidality. There's depression related suicidality. Uh, you know, I just recently published an article in the Tennessee Bar Journal about suicide and talked about lawyers with depression dot com, which is Dan Lukasik. He is up in New York uh, in Buffalo. He, and he is, if you will, the face of recovery from depression in the legal profession. Uh, lots of articles about how this happens, uh, of course, substance use disorders. And then lawyers who really don't really have a pathology per se that's driving this, but they just feel like there's no hope in their practice and they've invested so much time and effort in industry into becoming a licensed attorney, and they just feel like there's no way out. You know, so, I, you know, suicide and, and the whole issue of it, has been very personal to me because starting in 1982, when I went to inpatient treatment for substance use disorders for alcoholism and drug addiction, I had a very, very, very near miss with suicide. I mean, I can still remember what it was like. It was terrifying. As an alcoholic or an addict, 
you start to con yourself into thinking that your behavior is normal. Well, you know, everybody gets three DUIs. Everybody gets, you know, fill in the blank. Everybody does this or that or the other thing. But not everybody sits on the side of a bed with a loaded pistol cocked and in their mouth and deciding that they need to kill themselves. That's pretty, uh, you know, not everybody does that. So that's where I found myself on a, on a fall day in 1982. Uh, my sister had gone to treatment uh, eight months before. I had gone to her family week. I had learned way too much. I knew that I was in the throes of alcoholism and that I was not going to survive it probably. Uh, and I had to make a choice. Either I had to figure out that I had to try and live on this planet without alcohol and beat alcohol or go somewhere else. And I was just so miserable and in so much pain and, and, and you know, didn't have any hope. And that, that one little ray of hope, you know, is, is the thing that can save people's lives. But at any rate, I still don't know why I didn't complete suicide that day. But I distinctly remember sitting that was terrifying but I kept telling myself, look, everybody dies. And, you know, I don't know what's going to happen on the other side. But at least at least I'll be done with this. <laughs> at least, at least, at least, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm ready for something different. This is just not working out. I can't see a path forward. Very luckily for me, uh, I didn't complete suicide, made it into treatment. And I've had like the most fabulous life in recovery. It's just been beautiful and wonderful. And I'm so grateful. And I can't explain why I made it through that inflection point and other people don't. But it has made me very, very skilled, if you will, in picking up on that hopelessness and other folks and helping them. And I've been able to help folks. Some folks we've been able to help, some we haven't been able to help. Now, QPR, question, persuade, refer. There's a new training that TLAP is going to be offering the Tennessee Lawyers Assistance Program. Both of my professional clinical people are certified to teach it, and it is the CPR, if you will, for suicide. And so we're going to be training the legal profession here in Tennessee. Anybody who wants to sign up, they can do as many as 35 people each at a time. Uh, and it really is a great resource to, to spot trouble in your peers and, and have the courage to ask them, uh, you know, if they're okay. Believe it or not, that's a really difficult people to ask for people to ask. People are very uncomfortable in general just saying, hey, Becky, you know, uh, I, I want you to be honest with me. Are you thinking about hurting yourself? I mean, what's going on? Are you okay? That makes people very nervous, and it's really not that hard to do once you get used to it and get trained on how to ask it. People get scared that if I ask that question, it might actually cause somebody to commit suicide or complete suicide. And that's just not, uh, that, that's just not the way it is. If people know that you care about them, generally they're, gonna, they're willing to talk about it. So QPR is a big deal. And I know that Cindy and I talked about uh, this video that you can see at the TLAP website, TLAP.org. If you go to TLAP.org, Go to the suicide drop down and the very top page will be a YouTube video that you can click on. This video was uh, created by Texas and Pennsylvania. They're two lawyers assistance programs. And it asks the question, you know, well, we just must stop. We, we have to stop minding our own business. That was what it mm -hmm. says. Just ask or just ask the question. And then how we must stop minding our own business in the legal world. So, in other words, this whole thing of don't ask, you know, don't bother anybody. Forget that. I've got a, I've got a new, a new saying that I live by. I would rather apologize than eulogize. Okay, if I've offended you by asking a question, so be it. But I'm going to ask the question. We do this all the time in the lawyers assistance program. In fact, that's part of our intake to ask people how they're doing. So we're quite comfortable with it. But we want more and more people in the legal profession uh, to be able to know how to ask those questions and reach out and help people and make sure that they're OK. So anyway, I've got story after story of different cases and how things turned out, but the, probably beyond the scope of what we can talk about today. But I'll just give you two, two quick examples. Uh, one of my really best friends in law school. Uh, completed suicide in 2007 and actually jumped off of the Crescent City Connection bridges that go across the Mississippi River in New Orleans. Uh, 
nobody had any warning that we know of. I, I wasn't involved with him at that particular time. Uh, I was out doing other things and not even in the United States. I was out on a big sailing adventure, and, but it, it devastated our law school class to find out that that had happened. And no one really knew. There was no warning that anybody could discern. Got another call in a different case when I was actually the lab director in Louisiana from someone who had a pistol in their hand and was on the phone with me and was able to have a conversation and said, hey, you call me, can you put the gun down? Can we have a conversation? They're gonna work two minutes, two days, two weeks from now. Can, oh yeah, I can put the gun down. And fast forward, this was a young lawyer who uh, didn't have a lot of prospects out of getting out of law school. And that's another problem these days. It's so hard to get a job to cover the student loan debts. And he had tried to ultimately hang his own shingle and he was way in over his head and trying to practice law with not enough mentorship, et cetera, et cetera. And the more we worked through this over the course of a year, you know, getting him to therapists and supporting him, et cetera, et cetera, it became very clear that this person, even though they did well in law school and they were a bright, brilliant person, et cetera, et cetera, they had no business practicing law. This person's personality and who they were I mean, to get into the gladiator arena and fight in a courtroom or do or, or all of this win-loss stuff, it's just not that. This person was never going to be happy doing that. And so ultimately, uh, this person turns out to be one of the happiest people I know. This person is a scuba diving instructor in one of the most beautiful places on earth and, and went and did something else, you know? That's the other thing. It's like I went to law school, now I'm trapped. No, you're not trapped. There's a whole lot of things we can talk. There's a whole big world out there. I mean, law is just this one little piece of the whole universe. And uh, if you don't use your law degree to practice law, that's okay. Whatever you're going to do, you're going to be very competitive. I don't care if you're going to be a shoe salesman. You're going to be number one <laughs> because of your training. I mean, I don't care what you do, but, but this is not this is not a suicide pact. I mean, if, this, if law is really making you sick and it's not for you, then call your lawyer's assistance program. We'll help you get therapy. We'll help you get resources. We'll, we've got books. We've got information. All kinds of different things you can do. So that's a long answer, but that just kind of gives you a little bit of an overview of some of that. Well, it, it breaks our hearts when we see that and, and uh, that we've lost another attorney to suicide. Of course, anybody, but it, it hits home when it's our colleagues, especially when we know that it's unnecessary and that it's it's not the, the solution. And you know, if only we could figure out what the how you flip the switch. How, like with you, with with myself, found that that moment of clarity that said, "No, I am going to redefine myself and start living a different life." But uh, how to know how to flip that switch? Um, we're just not there yet. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, we're still fighting an uphill battle. I mean, there's so much stigma involved in all of this. You know, substance use disorders, being an alcoholic or an addict in recovery, that's pretty much part of our pop culture now. I mean, who cares? It's not the big trippy thing it used to be. You know, now we know like, oh, wow, you know, just name whatever movie star, or musician or who, whomever else in our pop, pop culture has been fighting addiction issues. The question doesn't become, oh, my God, they're an alcoholic or an addict. That's not the issue. The issue is, well, how are they doing? You know, they're doing OK or whatever. But. You know, you to start talking about other issues that are just other health issues. They're no, 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 no better, no worse, but like bipolar or depression or generalized anxiety disorders. People are much more reticent to talk about those things, uh, which is a shame. And my hope is that in the fullness of time, that there won't be any stigma about this. It would be like talking about, you know, your arm hurting or your leg hurting or whatever else. It's just a different health issue. And then we can talk about these things openly. And the other thing that needs to happen is that lawyers need to come to the to the conclusion that they are they're human beings. We're not a, yes. a this intellectual head floating in space. We're actually connected to a body. Okay, we're animals, and the stress does things to our body physiologically that we can't control. I don't care if you're a law review, if you're a Supreme Court justice, or if you just entered law school. 
your body is going to re- respond to stress the way a physiological body does, and you can't control that. And so the more we can learn about that and understand it, we have to respect that and make wellness and well-being a core part of what we do, the better off we'll be. Some jurisdictions are starting to include this physical and emotional well-being as part of competence in their actual court rules. You know, if we can get this, you know, codified where uh, you have to do it, it's not just a suggestion. This is something that you really have to do. Then lawyers might be able to get on board with it. But, you know, it's, it's going to take time to make these changes. I was sitting around with some young lawyers uh, maybe three weeks ago and we were having this conversation. And I said, I, I hope that one day you guys will be sitting around a table of the generation after you or maybe two generations. I don't know how long it's going to take. But I want the, the lunch conversation to be, oh, yeah, and I had this terrible case, but, you know, I'm working through it with my therapist and this other person talking about how they're working with their therapist. And then they get around to somebody else like me at the table, buddy, buddy, how, how's it working with your therapist? And I would say, well, I don't have a therapist. And I said, well, you don't have a therapist? Man, what a loser. Are you kidding me? You don't have a therapist? Good God, you're trying to do this without a therapist? Man, what's wrong with you? You must be like an idiot. So, you know, I want, I want the corporate culture to be that if, if you're not really having a mental health support in this job, that you're not taking care of yourself. I don't care who you are, what you do. But of course, if you practice in, uh, you know, like domestic litigation, the family law stuff that I was doing or criminal court stuff, and you're seeing all this evidence, it would be really smart for everybody to have a therapist. And at least go in quarterly, not necessarily to say, I'm, you know, I'm struggling, I'm having trouble, and can you help me? And, you know, what is my diagnosis? None of all of that. But to say these are the cases that I was involved in in the last quarter, and this is the type of evidence I saw, and this is how I feel about it, and to, and to be able to acknowledge that you were exposed to all of this stuff and to process it with a mental health professional to help you get this out of your body and into the atmosphere because we know about compassion fatigue and all of these other things burn out that happens because people just keep stuffing all of this, all of this, and they don't have an outlet to talk about it or talk about how it made them feel. And to think that you were just going to be stoic, well, so what? And fill in the blank. I mean, you see some terrible evidence, photographs, tapes, videos. You know, I was, I was doing a compassion fatigue seminar for a very large city district attorney's office. And the prosecutors were listening to this whole thing about compassion fatigue and how it affects them uh, when they see all this evidence. And then we started having a discussion. There were probably 70 lawyers in this big organization. And one of them said, you know, buddy, I, I have to say, I didn't, I didn't even think about this this morning. In a different part of our seminar today, we watched three different videos, very graphic videos of people being shot to death. We didn't even think about it. Yeah. We didn't even think about well, what is this doing? How is this affecting me? And that, that's a problem because, you know, it's really hard for us to see ourselves as we are. And these things happen slowly and imperceptibly. And what we might normalize and think is okay, other people might be horrified and say, my goodness, man, these people, I mean, what, what's going on? This doesn't even affect them anymore. So anyway, uh, you know, all of that needs to happen. The boundaries, the wellness, the well-being, the therapy, the, you know, and, and if we don't do all this, we can't deliver a really good job for our clients. I mean, how can you be 100%? Now, if you ask any lawyer, Oh, I don't know anybody who's an alcoholic or a drug addict, and nobody knows them. You know, out there. I don't know anybody with that problem. But I think everybody can admit that not one of us, but very few of us, have you know really instituted and, and put into our daily lives everything we should be doing for wellness and well-being that we're on the top, 100% on top of our game. You know, because we just don't carve out the time for it, et cetera, et cetera. So... You know, hopefully that will change. I, I think it has to because I really don't think the legal profession is sustainable the way it has been, you know, 20, 30 years ago, you know, when things were going 25 miles an hour and a handshake was good enough. I mean, now we're like moving at the speed of light, too much information, too much happening too quickly. And I have this one slide 
in a presentation that I do on professionalism, it's, it's, it's a PowerPoint slide. It probably has 20 words in red on it. And all these things, war, aliens, spy balloons, COVID, mass, passwords. I mean, all these things that, that hit us in 2024. That, I mean, these things are unprecedented. We've never had this much stuff coming at us in history, quite frankly. I mean, we've never had this much stuff on our plate. And then I've got another slide that Becky might not know who this is, but Cindy will know who this is. Now, it's like 44 years ago, people were only concerned about one thing, and I'm talking about around the world. 350 million people tuned in. I'm not talking about DV, DVR, I'm not talking about live TV. 350 million people around the world tuned, tuned in because they wanted to know about one single thing. And it was who shot J.R. Ewing on Dallas on the night TV show. Like that, that was the biggest problem in the world was who shot J.R. Ewing on a, on a TV nighttime soap opera drama. You know, and, and then you go back and look at this other slide with, with war and, I mean, just everything, toxic politics, climate change, I mean, all the things that are coming at us that we're just like, it's terrifying. And so we, we do live in a different world and we need better tools than we've ever had. So what was, what was working 40 years ago? I'm not going to be working right now. And by the way, my, the, my, my biggest enemy on that whole page, I mean, the terrible stuff we're dealing with. Passwords. I got this like frowny face. I mean, I have this seething, <laughs> inextinguishable resentment for passwords. Like, you cannot get a Kleenex out of the Kleenex box and blow your nose. What's your password? You can't have a Kleenex. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Like, everything in my life is, is slowed down by. I'm supposed to be doing 100 miles an hour, but, but I've got these speed bumps everywhere, these passwords. So, anyway, that's an aside that it's just another wrinkle in the pie, right? You know? Yeah. And how your analogy, it made me think of in Blazing Saddles when they're like out in the desert and then they get to the toll booth and it's like exact change only 10 cents. And he's like, oh, we got to go back and get a crap load of dimes. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Like, come on, man. Really? You know, really? It's just, you know, I mean, it's, it just never ends. But, you know, I, I know we can do better and I know we will do better. But, uh, you know, circling back to the, to the topic of, of what we got together on in the first place and suicide, you know, one of the things that was uh, one of the most heartbreaking uh, circumstances was we go in after this happens sometimes, uh, and, and, and TLAP has, you know, we have certifications, my master's level professional therapist, my clinical uh, team, my professional clinical team. You know, Lauren Castor is, is my senior case manager, and she actually has a, a certification in trauma debriefing. So if somebody is lost to suicide uh, in a law firm or in an organization like a public defender's office, et cetera, we go in, and, and if, if they'll allow us to, we, we'd love to go in and talk to them and just get together the people who, you know, with a core around the, around the person that has lost their life and, and help them because now they're left uh, heartbroken with all these uh, questions. And of course, a lot of the questions are, why couldn't I stop this? Why, how is this my fault? Why couldn't I have done better? Et cetera, et cetera. And I never will forget, uh, we were in one of these debriefings with a, with a group of maybe 10 people. And the thing about it is this one person, and this is a common tale, I mean, everybody loved him, gregarious, outgoing, just seemed like, you know, like the, the light of our whole office. And here this person is taking their own life and they're gone and nobody can even figure out what happened. And this one young lady lived probably, I think, maybe three blocks, she said, very close to where this person was living. They were, they were all young lawyers working in this organization. And at first, when we started talking to the group, everybody was reserved. And the more they started to let their hair down and start to share about it and feel it was safe, you know, to start sharing about how they were really feeling about it. And then you can kind of feel this moment when the dam breaks and people just let it out. And this, this, this one, one young lady, I mean, everybody loved this guy. Okay. And she says, you know, I just, I don't understand. And she was sobbing, you know, I was just 
three blocks away. Why didn't he call me? I mean, why didn't he? Le- why wouldn't he let me come over? Why, why couldn't, you know, why, 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 why? And one of my therapists said, the reason he didn't call you is because you would have stopped him. Right, right, right. You know, and that's just so profound and so heartbreaking. So, you know, once people get to a certain place in this, um, you know, a lot of times, you know, we've missed that opportunity and maybe missed some signs. And while they say suicide is one of the most preventable deaths, I mean, they still say that, they claim that. But by the same token, one of the most preventable doesn't mean that you're going to prevent all of them. And some people are just going to, you know, take their own life. And even if we did everything we could, some people are going to do that. But we can make we can make a drastic reduction. And I think I was telling Cindy uh, one of the stories that if you go watch this video, of, you know, why we have to stop minding our own business was about someone who survived jumping off of the Golden Gate Bridge. And uh, the story is that this person even had to take a bus, you know, to get to the Golden Gate Bridge and was very despondent, tearful, you know, been sobbing, just just a mess, you know, and, and visibly a wreck. And it, on the ride over there, nobody asked him anything or paid any attention to him or no, nobody said, hey, are you OK, you know? And the person then got to the Golden Gate Bridge and somebody walked up to him and thought maybe they were going to reach out and say, are you okay? But instead they handed him the cell phone. Could you take my picture with the bridge? You know, and everybody was just like oblivious, you know, and, and the person, once they jumped off the bridge and it's the same story, instantly regretted it and survived to tell the tale. But, but the story is, is that if one single person would have really reached out to me on the way to that bridge up until the time my feet left that bridge, and then hug me and said, are you okay? I, I, I'm telling you, I wouldn't have done it. You know, and so so that, that tells us that this is not so much about can I do this the right way or not so much about some special skill or training. This is about just a love for another human being that you can see who is in, in just suffering, that something is not right. In that moment, that movement of grace can, can happen through any one of us and you get the QPR training that makes it that much better. But just to, just to put your arm around somebody and say, are you okay? I mean, that, that is, you know, and it's, it sounds so, so stupid, so silly. It's like, you know, why, why are we missing these opportunities if that's all it takes? But, but yeah, that's how it works. You know, I was just going to say, but you spoke earlier about, you know, all of these in, intrinsic risk factors in the profession. And one thing I don't think we hit on was, you know, that attorneys, we, like you said, we, we have to recognize that we're human. And it sometimes it's hard for us to acknowledge that, you know, we have quote unquote weaknesses, right? That, oh, we're, we're not okay. I remember when I was uh, a young, young associate in big laws, like my first year practicing, and I was just really, really struggling. And, you know, I thank goodness had some really great mentors in the firm. Unfortunately, they they weren't in, um, you know, leadership positions, like decision making positions, but I did have these mentors there, thank goodness. Um, And I remember, you know, one was trying to give me a, a pep talk, but the pep talk was her relating a story about when she was a young associate and she was, you know, she was like deathly ill, but she, you know, was still coming into work to get get the job done. And she was telling me about how she was sobbing in the stairwell because it was so, you know, I, she was just in such a bad way. And that story was supposed to motivate me. And I just looked at her and I was like, has it ever occurred to you that that's not OK and that that's not the that shouldn't be the status quo and that's not the culture we we're you know we should be actively cultivating and you know i'm just you said you're not sure you know why you didn't go through with it that day i mean we're so grateful because obviously you're here sharing your story and destigmatizing these conversations and like you say the the more we can talk about these things and and just you know, and, and acknowledge it. 
right? Like in that same environment, in the big law environment, I was, I mean, I was losing weight. I was, I was so depressed. I was like, really, I looked sickly and I went back home and, you know, I had one, it was my fifth grade teacher and and she actually, (laughs) I actually broke my arm in fifth grade. And I remember she came over on the playground and she was like, what's wrong, chickadee? And so, you know, she, she has a special place in my heart, but she saw me as an adult, you know, 20 years later, she just saw me, you know, my whole family's there at this gathering. No one's asked me anything. And she just goes straight over to me and she said, what's wrong? You know, she, she didn't ask like, oh, how's it going? How is DC? Like she just cut straight to the core and was like, what is wrong? Tell me what's going on. And that, that was so, so powerful, such a powerful moment. And so I'm just, and thank you, buddy, for being here with us and doing this work and having these conversations. And like, like you say, the, the more we can, we can engage with it, you know, you'd rather be apologizing than you eulogizing. That's, that's so real. real. And I, I'm just so, I'm just so grateful that kindred spirits such as yourself are contributing to this active this active cultural change because it's not sustainable and we can and must do better. So thank you. And and you've made reference to, you know, really the way that lawyers treat each other in the profession. And I know that over the years of the almost 50 years in this profession is that, uh, well, 47 is that, um, I've just seen it drop drastically. And the judges, I, I, I know myself, I was maltreated by judges. And I just, a, a, a coaching client of mine told me a story the other day that she got COVID and she told the judge, hey, I need an extra week because I've been down with COVID. And the judge said, no. And she said, I've practiced in that jurisdiction 25 years. And based on this, she's strongly considering leaving the law to take care of herself. And and so we are, as people become more aware that no, we don't have to put up with this. You will have people who value their mental health leaving the profession when this kind of ridiculousness happens. Yeah, it's it's and it's hard to regulate that. I know that everything everything is really slow to change, as you know. And so, you know, nothing 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 ever happens timely and, and there'll be people harmed and there'll be more harm to the profession and lawyers and judges too. I mean, you know, everybody has it tough. The judge is, is constrained by their docket and they're trying to move their cases along and they're frustrated and and depending on their mindset, you know, I mean, whoever the judge is, God bless them. You know, I wish them well. They're probably a great person. They probably were trained to go shut up and cry in the stairwell and come back up and get on the bench. You know, right. I mean, it's like, well, wait a minute. That, that, that's our tool, like man up, shut up, pretend this ain't happening. Yeah. You know, just just do it anyway. Uh, and, and but but this is going to change. Look, this is going to be generational. And, and I think I think it's starting and I'll tell you a story about uh, one of my friends in Louisiana. He is in a several hundreds of lawyers, huge law firm. And this is probably in 2013, 2014, known him forever. Uh, We were going to lunch, just going to have a lunch one day in Baton Rouge. Hey, let's meet for lunch or whatever. And he he sat down to lunch and I could tell, I mean, I know him well. I mean, I could tell he was really something was really getting his goat that day. He was angry about something. I said, man, what's the matter with you? What's going on? And man, he started, it didn't take but a second. It's just like putting a match to gas. And he said, let me, let me tell you what's going on. I got roped into being on this hiring committee. I don't know why I agreed to do it, but this young kid was just in our conference room. And, uh, you know, this conference room cost more than the three of us will ever make in our collective lifetime. I mean, it's huge, big, beautiful. You know, it's like this palace, you know. And he said, buddy, he said, you know, he looked around, he said, yeah, 
you know, I might be willing to work here. You know, this is pretty nice. And like, okay. <laughs> and he said, buddy, we weren't 30 seconds into the, into the interview. He put his finger off. He said, let me tell you something. I might come to work for you, but I'm not working weekends. You can forget that. I like to play with my dog and I like to go with my girlfriend. I like to go to Starbucks. You're not going to grind me up in the bottom of some law firm working me to death. I'm going to have to have boundaries. I'm going to have to have a life outside of this law firm. And let me tell you what, my friend did not take kindly to that. I mean, he was, who do these young blankety blank, blank, blanks? And we're talking about South Louisiana. I mean, it's down there. I mean, they, you know, they just, they do some cussing down there in South Louisiana. And he was like, hey, blankety blank, 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 little blankety blank. And, uh, you know, who do they think they are? And, you know. We, uh, we rode in the bottom of the ship to make this firm what it was, and now they're unwilling to work for us, and you know, they want everything handed to them. You know, and he kept winding up and winding up, and finally was like, you know, I mean, buddy, what, what do they want? I mean, what do these kids want? You know, and, and I knew him well. And I shouldn't have done it to him, but I couldn't help it. I knew just where to stick the needle. I said, well, I said, Maybe they just want to be happy. And I thought he was going to, I mean, he like, I thought he was going to throw his iced tea at me in this restaurant. I mean, I just like, he really wanted to pick up some silverware and stab me, you know. But that's, but that's what we're dealing with. That's what we're dealing with. It's going to be cultural. Somewhere there's an equilibrium between, well, you know, I think I need to go to court in my sweatpants and I don't really need to prepare and my mom will help me and drive me there. Somewhere between that and like, you know, we need to we need to like make sure that everything is starched and our corners are perfect and let's go cry in a stairwell and put on a good face. Somewhere in between there is is reality and survivability. And and the coming generations are gonna have to define that. I mean they're gonna have to define that. The you middle know, path. Have, <laughs> yeah, and we have come a long way. I'm heartened over that. As a society, um, uh, you may remember back, I think it was the, oh gosh, had to be maybe the 72 presidential election when Eagleton, Thomas Eagleton, was uh, vice president or named a, as vice president. And then it came out because it, it, someone uh, leaked the information that he had been in, in a hospital uh, for treatment from, for uh, mental issues. And, uh, and, and so he withdrew from the ticket under pressure. And so it, I, I look forward to a day when someone who has checked themselves into a hospital, like I did for 31 days for uh, treatment, is considered to be a hero as opposed to shunned. Because it does, it takes courage to be vulnerable. And, you know, in, in, in this profession, I know what I found for myself. I've been just by way of background for our, our uh, I guess viewers is I'll be celebrating 15 years of sobriety in September. And as I think about how, you know, my catalyst for getting sober, uh, what, what drew me out of the abyss? Cause it's, it's a joke you have to make quickly. You have to jump out quickly and say, yeah, this is, I, I vote for life. It is that people reached out to me, but what I was told afterwards was that I was still very successful as a lawyer and my business was still going well. So people thought I was okay um, because of the, of the role I played. And so I, I can just urge our viewers to try to look a little bit deeper and maybe know that there are some of us who have put up armor. Um, that, uh, unlike I do now, no armor at this point, but then have the armor up and um, uh, are, are saying, nope, I'm fine, I'm okay, don't bother me. And, and, and one, one last thing, you talk about a toolkit is then when I got sober and went to AA after I got out of rehab, you know, I was embarrassed. I was like, I, I didn't feel that good about myself. And what one of with the women in the group at the very beginning, she said, you're lucky. 
Being an alcoholic is the biggest gift you ever got in your life because we have a toolkit for life. She said, my husband doesn't have a toolkit for living, but in, in recovery, you do get one. So wouldn't it be a beautiful thing is if everyone started in grade school, and I know it's happening some places, got a toolkit for living. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is a true story. I love a lawyer in, in Baton Rouge who's in recovery. There's three lawyers in a car, me and another lawyer who's in recovery and another lawyer in the back seat who's not in recovery. And we were coming back from Lafayette, Louisiana to Baton Rouge, and we had been in federal court. And this particular judge did not take kindly to our client's cause of action and thus did not take kindly to us and was giving us unshirted hell to the point that we're like, man, if we go back over there, we better bring bail money. And so the two lawyers in the front of the car you know, we're trying to figure out how to navigate this this judge who's got it out for us, and we are pulling out all of those tools from that toolkit and recovery that the lawyer in the back seat doesn't have. This lawyer in the back seat, by the way, intellectual giant, smarter than both of us in the front seat combined, but he's listening to all of this. And so about five minutes into the into our problem solving, he goes, where are you guys coming up with all this? <laughs> And my buddy goes, shut up, Nick. You don't, you, we're drunk. You don't know anything about this. Shut up. And so but we just keep working the problem. By five minutes later, he says, man, I wish I was a drunk. True story. <laughs> he was jealous of our toolkit. So, uh, but anyway, you know, hey, these things. The other thing that's helped is, is that, you know, I, th- I think people are much more aware now. And as you know, Cindy, we've come a long way in just science of what, what's happening to people. Why do we get these issues? Are they willpower? Are they a, a moral failing? Now we know that all of these things are driven by real diseases, physiological based, chemical brain diseases. We know so much more about it. And we also know that anybody's susceptible to this. That's the hardest sell that I have. I don't care how old you are, or how well you've been in the past. On any given day, anyone in our legal profession can develop depression, generalized anxiety anxiety disorder, substance use disorders. You just don't know. It's no different than cancer or diabetes or anything else or heart disease. And so that's helped a lot, too, because now, you know, for the most part, uh, I think the majority of people understand that, that, that these are things that people catch. And they don't go look for it. You know, it just develops through through no fault of their own. You know, well, uh, we we've greatly enjoyed our time together, and I have just one more topic I'd like to touch on quickly before we wrap up. Uh, I know you know a lot about addiction and about treatment, so we've uh, uh, it's been in the news lately about ketamine and and other legal substances being used as treatment. Do you have any point of view on that? Well, you know, uh, the, the, the best the best place to go for that kind of information to, to the experts. So I can tell you that just recently, and we just got a copy of it, the American Society of Addiction Medicine, ASAM, they just published their fourth edition. So this is a 10-year, a decade-long update. Their 2013 edition was just updated, and there's a whole chapter chapter 23 on safety sensitive occupations and it deals with how should we treat lawyers doctors nurses airline pilots all these licensed professionals it calls for a higher level of treatment and diagnostics and there is a section in there that doesn't go medication by medication but it talks about the fact that medicine does have a place a proper place in addiction treatment when it's used appropriately and by the professionals in a way that doesn't put the the patient at risk. But there apparently is a whole lot of new medication coming along every day and people trying to use different mood altering substances uh, to aid in the treatment. So I stay out of being a doctor or making any commentary on that other than to say it is a challenging environment right now because a lot of this is new medicine and new science. And so let's not forget how we got into the, 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 the latest crisis. Uh, you know, OxyContin was 
a cure all for pain and a, and a FDA approved medication that everybody was given everybody and everything was fine. I can tell you what Dr. Drew Pinsky said. He said, anytime you get a bunch of doctors evangelizing for a particular medicine, it's a, it's a problem. This should be case by case. People should be treated individually and see if medication is a part of their treatment. But to just start to blanketly throw medicine at a problem and say, we've got the answer, everybody take this medicine, it's a problem. Well, thank you so much. And do you have any other words of wisdom that you'd like to wrap up with? No, just, you know, let's all try and live our lives through love and compassion and, and doing the next right thing and, and, and stay out of the stairwell, okay? I stay out of the we're going to stairwell, okay? That's not that there's no good answers in the stairwell, okay? Come, come talk to some people who, who have love and compassion and can help. It's a great note to wrap up on. And uh, viewers, if you haven't had a chance to explore the services offered by Answering Legal, now's the time. And while you're at it, check out the information that Becky and I offer for free at LegalBurnout.com. This is Cindy Sharp and Becky Hallett, your co-hosts. And until we meet again, just, just breathe. breathe. Thank <laughs> you.